This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Joining me today for a cup of coffee to talk about the second season of Star Wars Visions. We are going to cover the first five episodes. They are the first one, Sith. Second, Screechers Reach. Third, In the Stars. Fourth, I Am Your Mother. And then fifth, Journey to the Dark Head. I've got two wonderful guests on Coffee with Kenobi. First, as returning guest, he is the co-host of Star Wars Reactions, Mr. David Modders. David, welcome back to the show. How you doing? Uh, thanks, thankful to be here and glad to be on with both of you. Well, it's, it's great to see you, buddy. I'm looking forward to your expertise on this. Speaking of expertise, this is his first appearance, not only on Coffee with Kenobi, but I believe it's your first podcast appearance. Am I right, Alex? Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Well, he is the Education Director at Yale University for the Science of Well-Being for Teens with Dr. Lori Santos. I am talking to Mr. Alex Marmer. Alex, welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. Thanks, Dan. I'm excited to be here, ready to talk some Star Wars. Let's do it. And did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yep, Marmer. That's the way to Marmer. do it. Marmer. Good. I am glad to hear that. Well, again, with a name like Zare, I know how important it is and how tricky it can be to pronounce a last name. We're going to talk about the first five episodes at first. Alex and I were like, yeah, let's talk about all of them. Are you kidding? That's impossible to do in one hour. There's there's too much. There's so much richness. Before we get into each episode individually, David, I'm going to start with you. What did you think uh, briefly about the first season of Star Wars Visions, and, and how did that affect your excitement level for this season? I, I Well, I loved Volume 1. Uh, in fact, um, I liked it so much, I did a psychological profile of the Ronin from the first episode, The Duel. Um, my co-host Aaron, we talked about this a little bit tonight. We recorded tonight discussing the first three episodes because, like you said, you can't cover all these in one night. But I was, I really enjoyed Volume One. He was less excited about it. Uh, if you listen in on Friday, you'll see he has a very different view of this season. He's really enjoying it, and um, I'm enjoying these episodes even more than uh, Volume One. Oh wow! Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Alex, what about you? You know, I've got a similar reaction. I think I also enjoyed this better than Volume 1. I, I feel like a lot of my mental energy in Volume 1 went to just wrapping my head around what it looks like to have Star Wars in, like, A, an anime format, B, like, I don't remember how many episodes, 10 different anime formats in a single season. Mm -hmm. so this time around, I feel like I was able to, I don't know, appreciate it on a different level, like, look, look past just what it looks like on the surface and really kind of digest what it was about. But this time I was also taking notes on the episodes, so... I think we all know like that means learning a little bit about better about what's going on and paying closer attention. Absolutely. That's what I emphasize to my students all the time. You write this down, you're going to learn it uh, in a much more profound way. I really liked season one. I'm not a big anime guy. I'm still not a big anime guy. And there were some episodes that really impacted me that I loved and some that did not work as well, but I appreciate the creativity my one of my main things in appreciating any good story, any good myth is that I want it to be original. I want it to be creative and I want it to have really good, solid characters. Those are the things that are my recipe. Mm. And I think we've got a mixed bag of that here. But but it's also not fair to really use that particular litmus test because these are very short, self-contained episodes. When I knew there was season two at first, I thought, great, I want to see the continuation of what happened from season one. And then I realized that was not going to be the situation, but we're going to get brand new stories and not all of them are going to be anime. And ironically, even though I'm not a big anime guy, first I thought, well, but this is Star Wars Visions. And then I saw some of the, the stills and then I got to see some of the stuff. And then uh, I was fortunate enough to get to see all the episodes really early. And I thought, okay, this, this is something now do I, how do I compare it to season one? I'm still not sure. I'm hoping this conversation will sort of flesh that out. But let, let's just jump right into it. The first episode is Sith. This is directed by Rodrigo Blas, I believe is the name. Uh, and it, it goes, it covers um, an individual named Lola. She is a former Sith apprentice. She has a droid named E2 that is with her. And she has a very fascinating way of looking at the Force 
Uh, and then we've all seen it, I assume. I mean, I know the two of you have, but those of you listening have. So let's talk about this. David, give me one word to describe the episode. And then your overall, we'll dive into it a little more, but give me your one word and overall thoughts on Sith. My one word for this particular episode is gorgeous. Gorgeous. I don't think I've ever seen animation like this. And after watching it, multiple times i'm watching this and i'm thinking not only do i want to see continuation of lola's story it, along with e2 i want to see that animation for like in an hour and a half movie <laughs> I'm like, I just don't stop i want to keep seeing it and so outstanding um episode and uh i could say way more but um i'll let you guys go as well but gorgeous excellent alex what about you you know, this is funny. I mean, David, I think I think we're on the same wavelength. My my first word that comes to mind, I think, is texture. It's just as as mm-hmm. soon as we saw this, it was like, oh my god! Like you can see the brush strokes in in the animation style. You could see with E two, like there there was this one moment where when E two was moving, you could see that even though there were brush strokes, there were reflections of things around him. So it showed that like he was chrome, but he was painted, and that was amazing. I've never seen something like that before. And I, I just think that was a hell of a way to open up the season. And I, I left feeling the same way that like, oh my God, like, A, I want this to be like a feature length movie or, or like something like Clone Wars. I want 140 episodes of this. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and when, when I was a kid, I had, I thought about a, uh, a video game that I wish existed. It was one where like the world starts in black, black and white. And as you open up things, you add more color. And as I was watching this, I was like, oh my God, this is a great idea because I'm watching it happen. It was it's just, I, I think, a beautiful episode. You know, I've got so many words I could use, but I, I think I want to start with metaphorical. Mm. I mean, it's it's an absolutely gorgeous tapestry. It, it very much reminds me of Charles Soule's Light of the Jedi, where he uses one of the Jedi, Avar Chris, but describes the Force through music, and that's how it impacts her. And this, with Lola, is just the way that the art brings it to light, but there's so much metaphor and all these episodes really, uh, it's hard sort of not to picture visions without it going into the deeper aspects of light versus dark. And that's a very Star Wars thing, but we don't always have it so heavy handed. And I don't mean that as a pejorative, but this is a really resplendent way to look at the metaphor of light versus darkness. And when it's told through the tapestry and I'm using that word purposefully of art, You've got something really, really gorgeous. So, David, uh, let's talk about the episode. And, and both David and Alex, tell me sort of things that jump out at you, what you loved about it. Was there anything that didn't work? Let's just take it anywhere. You know, we're sitting around having coffee. You know, <laughs> there's no structure. We're just going to talk. <laughs> well, for me, what what stood out was Lola saying, I am no Sith, you know, and uh, this just brought me back to Rebels. And um, Ahsoka saying, I'm no Jedi. And so you see a lot of homages, not only in this episode, but, um, you know, throughout each of these. And I I love it when these creatives uh, do this. And uh, so that really stood out to me. Um, The other thing that did, and it's piggybacking, Dan, off what you said, and and I'd mentioned a little bit ago about uh, Victor Frankl's book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. It ends with... Dr. Frankel, who's a psychiatrist, when he went into Auschwitz, as he went into concentration camps, he he talks about this dichotomy in humans. And, and just like you mentioned, Dan, light and dark, Dr. Frankel says that, keep in mind that humans created the gas chambers. And at the same time, you have humans who are walking into the gas chambers with the Lord's Prayer on their lips. And when he says that, it's just that dichotomy. And I can see Lola when she looks up at the Sith Lord and, and says, I, I have light and dark in me. And, and, and accepting that and having a balance of that versus rejecting it. Yeah, you do. It's okay. You can deal with it. And she does. And um, so those are just a few of the things that, that stuck out to me. Yeah, your mom made me cry. That was really beautiful. Oh, oh mm. man. Mm, the beautiful. Alex. I mean, David, I, I hadn't even thought about the, I don't know what you call the opposite of a parallel, but the resemblance between uh, between 
Lola and Ahsoka. I mean, that's really cool. And this whole time I had been thinking of Lola as someone trying to reorient herself to the light. Mm. But I mean, I, I, I don't know, maybe she's maybe she's striving for a little bit more gray. And it seems like that's kind of where she ends up at the end, understanding that like there's light and dark inside of her. Um, the fact that it fo focuses so much on art is, I don't know, I thought that was really interesting to me. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a musician for fun, and I've noticed that when I'm going through hard things, I mean, I tend to like to write upbeat, happy music. But the dark comes out when you're really feeling strongly. It comes out in your lyrics. It come, uh, comes out in the, I don't know, the expressive ways you play. You'll write angry or sad things even when you want happy things to come out. Um, and so I could really relate to... I don't know Lola's journey there with with her art. I thought it was really cool to see uh, to see an, another Force artist, like uh, Dan was saying about Light of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, but I think all of these things took me a long time to come around to appreciating because I was hung up on the visuals for so yes. long, like just seeing um, like seeing a lightsaber shaped like a rapier. And then seeing it, the, seeing the second end come out, and that one's also shaped like a rapier. It's just like, oh my god, this is so cool. So it, for that episode, it took me a long time, I think, to get around the the cool factor to to really think about, okay, like what's happening here? Uh, what are the what are the interesting things that stand out? Um, and, and a, la a last tidbit I thought was, was yeah. really fun is this is the second instance we've seen of the name Lola, I think, and the first one was Little Leia's droid, which I thought was nice. I didn't know if there was any kind of That's right. parallel there, but but I thought it was fun. That's so cool. Uh, and wasn't Lola, wasn't that Carrie Fisher's, didn't she have a dog named Lola? Oh, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, nice. right. yeah. Okay. So what I love about this is, first of all, I should go first. I don't want it to follow you to every time. That's going to get, <laughs> that's going to be rough. Um, <laughs> what I love about this is when it started, I was like, well, okay, this is really pretty. This looks nice. I get what they're doing with the force and, and, Oh, I don't want to get the darkness to overcome me and all very fun. Um, but then I thought maybe this is going to be a little slow. And then, um, we get a bit of an invasion and we see those three Sith, uh, all of them stunning, absolutely stunning designs, especially the chief oh. Sith Lord, uh, absolutely gorgeous. She's on that wheel bike that's very much reminiscent of General Grievous, which, of course, I see you both shaking your heads. Of course, how could you not think that? And uh, the escape, the way she would pilot this thing and the way the wheel would kind of rotate around itself uh, was really great. Again, but my word was metaphor. And the whole thing, you know, while we can't relate to the Force because, you know, in this world, there, the Force doesn't exist like it does in Star Wars. And... That's okay because this to me is about anger. The whole thing is about her fighting her anger. You know, I keep getting these dark smudges when I'm creating, which you alluded to earlier, Alex. Mm. And that's us, right? That's whatever you're doing. You know, it's very easy, especially when COVID was at sort of in its peak. It was really easy to get angry or to get frustrated and to let that affect how you acted, how you treated, how you worked, how you played, how you did everything. And so she has to fight with that, but she does it creatively. And then when she fights the Sith Master, uh, he wants her to kill him. Uh, he wants her to be the new Sith. And she's like, I don't want to do it. And when she realizes and accepts, which it feels like she kind of knew that all along, but she had to outwardly proclaim it as well as, uh, and that sort of manifest it internally as well. And it made it more realistic. It's almost reminded me of like the, you know, confession, for example, if you're Catholic, mm -hmm. you, you know, you go to confession and yes, can you just share your, your prayer, your sins secretly in your brain. Yeah. But the act of saying it out loud mm -hmm. uh, is an honesty that I think is very unique and psychologically speaking as well, very powerful. It becomes more than a rote thing. It becomes a very uh, symbolic and also very actualized thing. Once she does that, she turns on and what I thought you said rapier, which I like, I thought it was a katana as well, kind of a weird shaped katana, but the other side was yellow, which reminds me of Ray. Uh, from the rise of Skywalker and the original mm. uh, Kenner Luke Skywalker action figure too. And so then she's got red nails. She's like, I got both boom kills him. But then she finishes her painting. She's not worried about the darkness overtaking her because she has found some inner peace with that. And again, just hearing myself talk about this, like this, this is a really, really smart piece of storytelling 
And I like that the, the, the symbols and the metaphor is there in your face, but you don't have to go that direction. You can just enjoy the beauty and the story and, and the terrific lightsaber battle. And I said earlier on the live show this week, it's pretty neat to watch a new Star Wars lightsaber duel that feels fresh. And that's getting harder and harder to do after all these years of great Star Wars storytelling. Yeah. Well said, man. Well said. I, you got, see, this is Dan, you're, I've always said this. You're a school teacher. However, you're a psychologist at heart. Oh. I'm telling you, every time you have something, you're like, I'll yeah, take it. Say, saying it manifests it, man. It, it, it actualizes it. Well mm -hmm. said, my friend. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, I forgot to get a letter grade for all of you. Uh, I'll just start first. I thought this was an A+. Plus. Yeah, I had, I had I had the same response. I, I mean, this was my favorite episode of the whole season, and I was very happy with it. Same, same. I think I think uh, my preview this another one, but yeah, A plus for sure. I, yeah. A plus for me. It's uh, I, I think I have another one that might be a little bit higher for me. We'll oh. see. But it might be, but they came out swinging with this first episode. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's hard to top. Agreed, agreed. Well, let's look at the next one. This one is called Screechers Reach. Uh, this is about a young girl named Doll. She works in a sweatshop with her friends, uh, Bathan, Quinn, and Kina. They hear that there is a place called Screechers Reach, which is this remote cave with a ghost. And Doll basically says, hey, let's do this. I want to get out of here. And things go awry, gentlemen. Things go awry. So, David, one word to describe it and overall reactions. Yeah, powerful. Just powerful. Um the reason why I said that is because I think the way that they do the music, and I think, you know, Alex really hit on it. I, I'm admittedly, um, I wish I had that talent like Alex has. I, I have kinesthetic talent. I was very blessed in that. I'm very thankful for it. I listen to music. I appreciate it. I love it. I wish I was more talented in it. Um, but dang, I can listen to it and enjoy it. So I, you know, I think about the Kiner brothers and Rebels and Clone sure. Wars. and stuff. I think of John Williams. The music in this, particularly when Dahl is walking up the steps of that Sith ship with the Sith mother, is so powerful. And, um, you know, I, I was in tears along with Dahl. And, and I think the music really did it along with the animation. And... Um, I did lose weight, uh, water weight with crying. I am more than willing to admit it. I was like, oh, this is just <laughs> this twist, you know? And so we could talk about that a little bit more, but I'll, I'll stop there because, again, just like the first one, I can talk for a long time about each episode because I enjoy them so much. But, but powerful, and the music really brought that power home for me. Wonderful. Uh, I'm sorry that made you sad, but I appreciate that uh -huh. you, you put it into your – into your analysis. Alex, what about you? How did, how did this episode hit you? One word and overall thoughts. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's hard to come up with one word, but after thinking about it for a while, I think the word that comes to mind is trust. And I, I think the reason for that is that like, after thinking about the way this episode went, I mean, when doll goes off with, uh, I watched the behind the scenes footage and it looks like that figure is re re uh, referred to as, I think it was the Sith mother. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. as doll goes off with her, I couldn't help but thinking about the similarity between that and the way that Anakin went off with Qui-Gon and by a matter of luck ended up with someone who was a good influence and not a secret Sith Lord. Um, and so, I, I don't know, I think that really, it really hit me kind of, I mean, in a sense, how lucky little Anakin was, how unlucky little Doll was, and how neither of them knew any better. Um, so I think the, that's the reason that trust comes to mind. I mean, maybe maybe not trust as a virtue, but... Trust is something that that they used to practice and taken advantage of. Yeah, the uh, I I would love to say my word is uh, I can just create a new word and hyphenate and called it messed up, but I don't think that's my word. My word for this is macabre. Like this one bugged me. Like this one bothered me a lot. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Mason missed the first one. He only watched like the last part of Sith, but he watched this, and I'm watching with him thinking, oh gosh, this is sort of a heavy idea for a nine year old. But after it was done, he goes, Dad, that was cool. I liked it. I'm like, great. Um, I this is my least favorite one. And not because it's not well done, not because it's not well told, and not because it's not powerful, because it is all those things. But I 
still am in the camp of I like Star Wars to have hope. This was not, this was the antithesis of hope. Uh, sort of why sometimes Andor didn't always work for me perfectly because while I was, again, you're not going to find a better made show besides the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, of course. Um, but it is, uh, this one was, was, this was very heavy for me. I mean, well, let's talk about why David, it sounds like it really affected you, uh, uh, emotionally as well, but talk about your reactions in why it was a difficult. Well, it did because, you know, and, and I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of what Alex said is that, you know, as I watch this, you know, you see this young girl doll who doesn't have a life. She's working in a, it feels like, a, you know, I know it shows a factory, but I think of these, um, um, what do they call them? You know, uh, uh, sweat, sweat houses sweatshop. or sweatshop. Yeah. Or, or sweatshop. Thank you. Thank you. Where, you know, people are, are not being paid what they should be paid, being abused, and they want a better life. And I get that. When Aaron and I, uh, my co-host, we recorded earlier tonight, we were talking about this. And Dan, just like you said, this episode bothered Aaron and me. And for the reason that um, you have a young person who wants to better her life, and I get that. And then just like Alex said, instead of having Obi-Wan or Qui-Gon or a good parent, a good Jedi master to guide you, she's fooled. And, and one of the things that Aaron brought up was that medallion that she has. And when the Sith mother first speaks through it, one of the things Aaron brought up was, is, wow, does this feel like real life and how social media can really be used to speak to our kids and to really negatively affect them? You know, how are, are bad people coming into our homes via that, via social media and so on? And this, that's why it really hit home. And, there, and, and like you said, they're not a hopeful ending. You see her eye and you, you, she's in tears and her friends are brokenhearted. And um, this episode felt the most real world of, of all yeah. of them. And so, so that's why it just it struck, you know, I think Aaron and I, like it did you, it just, it really bothered us. And I think it was meant to. Mm -hmm. You know, David, I mean, what, what you've just said really makes me think of like of tragedy mm -hmm. and what tragedy makes me think of is Anakin's fall. And that makes me kind of see, see a lot of parallels here too. I mean, I think I'm talking a lot about parallels, but I'm sure a lot of that is not accidental. No. I mean, what we saw for, um, uh, I don't know what the timeline was, something like 12, 12 or 14 years from Phantom Menace through Revenge of the Sith, we saw Palpatine's insidious influence over Anakin. I mean, it's like a mm. talisman whispering, whispering things, building up your courage, uh, helping you understand what a larger role for you in the galaxy might be, tempting you with, I don't know, freedom, more, more power, more ability, um, and then taking you away from your friends, taking you away from your lo loved ones, leading you down a darker path. Um, so I just, I, that occurs to me now. And I think that's pretty interesting. Agreed. Uh, any other things about this that uh, jumped out to you that you really would like to bring up? Yeah. Um, I mean, a couple of things I've got, I've, people listening won't be able to see. I've got a full <laughs> page of notes about this one episode. So a lot of things came to mind. Um, uh, I guess one, one of the ones that I wanted to highlight was uh oh i don't know there's so many options i mean like i saw i saw parallels between almost the mother sith and and mother talzin and the way they were presented so like like uh, mother talzin from the clone wars i mean like aesthetically it looked like it, i don't know there's this regal robed figure who is somehow tapped into the dark side um, the medallion felt a lot like uh, some kind of holocron, although I guess it's a, a new kind of Sith artifact we might not have seen before. I mean, we've seen the Wayfinders. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, another thing that comes to mind, I mean, uh, I, I, like you, Dan, like to see a little bit of hope at the end of an episode. And that almost just makes me think this isn't complete. Like, I wouldn't be devastated if the first entry in a new, in a new trilogy led off with tragedy and follow it up with two releases, Restoring mm -hmm. Hope. Um, and which is interestingly kind of the opposite of like the, the, the fall of Anakin Skywalker in the prequels. Um, thankfully, we have like four, five, and six after that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that, that I, I also felt a little bit sad. And I think I've probably got my own headcanon about what Dahl does in the future to like return to his friends and, and like claim back his 
I don't know, his, his, his light. Um, mm. But that was something I got thinking about just as, just as you were both talking. I like that you brought that up because then in, in episode five, of course that ends in tragedy too. And then the, the fall makes the, uh, the resurrection so much more poignant, obviously. The uh, the thing about this, um, let's talk about the ghost for a second. The ghost was scary, and it kind of reminded me of a classic Scooby Doo Banshee with a lightsaber. Like that, <laughs> that was cool. So I'm glad <laughs> you said Banshee. I mean, I think that's intentional. I my instinct when I was watching it and thinking about it was okay. This this reminds me of a Banshee, and I was thinking like, wait, aren't Banshees Celtic or Irish? And I looked it up, yes. and they are. And Absolutely. the animation studio that that made this is an Irish studio, and so I was like, okay, that's just kind of cool. That tracks, yeah, exactly. And I know I love I love the the mythological uh, stuff here. And I know James Waugh, uh, who's one of the executive producers on this, is a buddy of mine, and he he's very steeped in mythology. Uh, I don't know how much he had, uh, if he, you know, what kind of guidance he ever had any part of the creative process of this, but it definitely made me think of that. I love that this necklace <laughs> that is being held so tight by Doll the entire time. It looks, it kind of remind me of the shell and I'm not being silly, but it reminds me of the shell from the little mermaid when Ariel gives up her voice mm. and it goes inside that shell because really that's what doll is doing. Isn't it? Uh, giving up his, uh, agency, uh, for, in hopes of a better life, you know, the path to, well, I don't know the CS Lewis and counts people say, you know, you know, the, the path evil is paved with good intentions. Right. And so he wants a better life for himself and, uh, for his friends, probably, uh, hopefully maybe, Mm. And but I'm watching this thing is pulsing, and I and then I thought, like you mentioned earlier, Alex, I'm like, well, this is like a holocron. I'm like, no, 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 this is a communicator, and it's shaped like the Sith Eternal symbol that was first uh, presented to us in the Rise of Skywalker. Even her ship, the Sith Mother, which this is a great. I love that it's the Sith Mother because the Sith takes everything and warps it and twists it. You know, uh, if we go with the, con- the continue the the Christian idea. Mary, you know, the mother of Jesus, um, is everything about love and selflessness. Whereas this Sith mother, who looks um, ostensibly like a mother, her eyes kind of give away the evil. And and I have goosebumps now just thinking about how creepy and how gorgeous the animation is. And she even comes down this little clamshell thing, which looks like the Sith emblem as well. And the way that... um, this person is lured in it and continued uh, encouraged to use their rage. Uh, but is it rage or just it's fear, but fear, as we know, is a path to the dark side. You're all saying the lines from the Phantom Menace in your heads right now, uh, mm-hmm. most likely. And I didn't need a Sith necklace to tell me that. I just know we're big Star Wars fans. So I, I like it, but in, and I was really moved by, um, by the friends Mm-hmm. Uh, of doll i don't know who the old as bathan is that the the sort of the 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 elder statesman that yeah, is constantly right. uh, and even that's like he almost takes on the 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 archetypal uh role of comforting the child right so yeah. this is is warping um all these ideas of traditional gender roles and identity and it's pretty smart also but again I, if i'm gonna grade it oh gosh I, <laughs> i'm so torn because I give it a, I'll give it, I'll give it a B plus. Uh, I mean, stylistically and artistically it's an A plus, but to me, how I consumed it, as much as I appreciate all the things about it, and I could write a heck of a paper about it, as I'm sure you both could too, I'll give it a B plus. David? Yeah, I, um, I'm going between A minus and B plus. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to channel my, inner Tom Gross who can be influenced one way or the other by conversations. <laughs> um, and in talking to you, I'm going to go with a minus uh, okay. because of things both of you said, um, it, it bumps it up a bit for me. I really enjoyed what both of you said and it got me thinking even more deeply about this. So I'll go a minus. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to land on a minus too. Mostly because I, I think the storytelling is an a, but the way it made me feel is a B plus. Like I just, that's not what I want to go into star Wars usually feeling unless again, there's a part two in season three or something, which would make me feel way better. That would give them an a so for extra credit. Um, but I think I would land on an a minus. Yeah. I love your optimism. I don't, I don't have a lot of faith in doll. I'm, I'm afraid that doll's done for, I hope I'm wrong, but I really wanted to give it an a minus, but I just, Mm. It's as, this is what Mace would say. Like it's as close 
percentage wise to an A minus you can be without actually being an A minus. That that how about that, mathematicians? How about that? We got an eighty nine point nine 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 nine. Yes, but we're we're gonna round down. We're gonna channel our inner solo for the Kessel Run. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. All right, picture this. It's game night. You've played all the games in the house. You're having a great time, but you know there's something that's a little bit more out there for you. So why not try KiwiCo? We recently got the Domino Machine where you build and then take dominoes that are included in different colors and stack them up and then turn on the machine that you have built and then watch your creativity and your imagination fly. And of course, I am again and talking about KiwiCo. KiwiCo is defining the future of play by making it engaging, enriching, and seriously fun. They create super cool hands-on projects designed to create a lifelong love for learning among kids. Each month, KiwiCo delivers crates packed with fun and sparks creativity with kid-friendly topics and activities. As I said, the project we got was the Domino Machine. What Mason and I loved about it was it was involved, but it wasn't involved. You know what I mean? It took about an hour, hour and a half to build and that was at a leisurely, informative, exciting pace. You know, as a teacher, what I care about is people having fun, being engaged, and learning. And if I can get all three to happen at the same time, then I feel like I've done my job. And KiwiCo did exactly that for Mason and myself. It was like the third or fourth crate that he's built, but the first one he's built as a nine-year-old, and it was something that he really liked. In fact, after he built this domino machine, and we played with it for a while, he talked about what are other jobs that people have where they can build things. And I thought that was incredibly cool. Your child does get these super cool hands-on science, art, and geography projects delivered to your door every month. They're going to be so excited to see these arrive in the mail. The day the box arrives will be their favorite day of the month. You'll be surprised at how high quality the materials are too. These are really engineering, science, and art projects for children. Another reason I love KiwiCo is that it encourages children to be innovators and creative thinkers. They're not going to believe what they can build and accomplish with KiwiCo. It gives them the tools to learn new skills, build new experiences, and make new connections to the broader world. The best part? Watching their confidence grow as big as their smile and their imagination. Redefine learning with play. Explore hands-on projects that build creative confidence and problem-solving skills with KiwiCo. Get 50% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line at KiwiCo.com slash CWK. That's 50% off your first month at K-I-W-I-C-O dot com slash CWK. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, let, let's talk about the third episode. This episode is called In the Stars. Uh, the uh, It's animated by Punk Robot. Is, and Gabriel Osario is the... Uh, director and writer of this. This is about two sisters, Coton and Tachina. They're the last of their kind. The Empire has conquered their planet and basically committed genocide and has taken the clean water and harvested it for themselves. Uh, there's all kinds of pollution everywhere, a lot of beautiful symbolism. Uh, and then it's got quite an exciting little ending too. Uh, David, what's your uh, one word for describe this one and overall reactions to it? Emotional. Emotional. Um, you know, I, I'd watched the, you know, Dan, when you were over in London covering all this, um, I did watch, um, Amy Radcliffe's interview. Uh, well, she hosted this uh, panel with all the creatives, right. And it was so neat to see this Gabriel Rosario speak uh, about where this came from for him. And, um, you know, these two sisters, uh, Tachina and Coton, the younger one, the older one, um, I just, I, I think the setup at the beginning with the painting through the straw and how beautiful the painting and animation is and telling the story of this mother, uh, the emotional stuff starts as soon as you see the mom with the two young girls and then talking about the force without talking about the force, mm -hmm. you know, just beautifully done and uh, sets up the ending um, where, again, I lose even more water weight uh, <laughs> gosh, I'm like, I'm five pounds less. Um, after, I gotta hydrate you. I gotta get some water here. Um, but uh, the at the beginning, when 
Tachina says, mom became a star. Everybody did. I'm, uh, I'm tearing up. And at the end, when it was Tachina's belief and the hope that you talk about, she's hopeful. She's just full of it. And I love it that you see mom's star appear again, then two more, which I really think of as Tachina and Coton up there, you know, and then on so many biblical levels and spiritual levels, I think of those three things. So again, um, I have a note written, I'm not crying, you are. Uh, no, actually, <laughs> actually I am. <laughs> so just so powerful, so moving. And and then I have a million other things and little call outs and homages and but I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Emotional, very emotional. Beautiful. Alex, what about you? One word and overall reactions. I think my word is a little aptly lame. And th- the word is nice. I thought this was a nice episode. It, I don't know. It felt like a, a Pixar movie hmm. condensed. Um, hmm. I, I mean, in contrast to the last episode, I have half a page written on this. And I think that's because I had, I don't know, about um, half as much I felt to say about it. Uh, I hadn't noticed until David pointed it out how neat it is that they talk about the force without talking about the force. That's very cool. And mm. I don't think that's something we've seen a lot of. But other than that, I think, uh, I mean, I thought it was fun, the the dynamic between the sisters. Again, that that felt like something we would see maybe in a Pixar movie. But it also reminded me of the relationship in Kenobi between Obi-Wan and little Leia. Little Leia is just running out, rushing into things, like courageous, bold, running forward, asserting herself as Leia's want to do. Um, and then Obi-Wan is constantly like, no Leia, no Leia, stay here, Leia, don't do that, Leia. So I thought that was fun. Um, I also thought it was interesting. I mean, the the mother was clearly strong in the Force. It's not clear whether she was a Jedi. We never saw a lightsaber, I don't think. Mm-mm. And maybe she also just knew this was some power she had. Um, so that was unclear. Uh, otherwise, I think... It left me feeling good. It kind of felt like one of those, um, I hate to say filler, so instead I'll say character development focused episodes from Rebels or Bad Batch. Uh, Like It felt like something where it was important for understanding better the characters you're working with, not necessarily for moving forward with an exciting plot line. So that's basically my feelings around it. I like it. I like it. My word, I'm going to say organic, and I'm not trying to be pedantic. Uh, I, I really think um, this whole thing is about life uh, in different forms and uh, what is important. Uh, water is, is is the 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 eternal symbol that keeps on giving to us uh, through Star Wars, through great stories uh, since forever. The emphasis, uh, my own, my my word was almost familial because of the the idea of love and working with your family. Right away, uh, I will say that when I saw that TIE fighter and I mentioned this on the live show this week as well, I said to Mason, this is awesome. Like, look at that TIE fighter. Like, I mean, is this, is it stop motion? Is it claymation? What, I mean, what is yeah, it? Or that is was it, or cool. Is it, yeah. It was beautiful. And it almost looked like a delicious chocolatey graham cracker. I went like, Oh, I want to take a nibble of that TIE fighter. <laughs> that was <laughs> so, um, I thought it wrapped up a little too quaintly. Uh, because not usually visions like you feel like, oh, like you've, you've been through it. Like you've been through a marathon emotionally. Um, this just wrapped up nicely and I don't have a problem with that. It was nice to have a happy ending after the, the second episode, but, um, hmm, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to save it right there. David, uh, what would you like to uh, bring up about this one? Well, I, I, one of the things that I think about is, and, and the three of us have talked about it in the previous um, installments here, is this issue of balance. But instead of it between being between light and dark, what, uh, you know, Alex hit on it. Um, Obi-Wan helping Leia, um, the balancing that out. I thought about it here with Colton saying, hey, you know, she's kind of really acting Kane and Jarrus like let's let's hide or reject the force like a lot of the Jedi after Order sixty six right you can't show this and don't bring a lightsaber out like Kanan and stuff like that so again I really thought about Rebels quite a bit but then the balance between um um uh, Coton wanting to to be careful and and be patient uh, with this and not uh, get yourself in bad situations with the Empire you've got Tachina with this unbridled enthusiasm and hope and 
you know, belief. Um, and I have that written in my notes here. And I love that balance and how when those two balance that, they beat the empire. And they and they allowed this water to flow. And of course, you see the whole ecosystem change of the planet. And that was very beautiful. Mm-hmm. And then very organic, like you said, Dan. So I, I just, I love the balance between them you know, like we've been talking about light and dark, but here uh, between hope and belief and just kind of a bit of a recklessness with the caution that Coton has, that combination together, and I love how they're holding hands at the end, bringing those two things together, and and they make it happen. So a nice balance does it. Love that. Alex? Well, you know, I'm really happy that David brought up Kanan because there was the whole time I was thinking like, God, this sounds just like a Jedi I've I've seen before in some media and I couldn't place who it was. But yeah, it's exactly Kanan. It's like in Rebels, if I remember, it's been a little while, but if I remember correctly, it was Ezra pushing for we have to do more. Kanan saying we can't reveal ourselves. We're our tight familial unit. It's about protecting us. Um, and so I just... I, I think that's right. I actually, okay, so I think my grade in might, and on this might end up going a little bit higher than I would have oh. given it originally. And I also loved the, like, re, the um, restoration of the ecosystem. Like, that really came out in, like, in the colored gold. I thought that was beautiful. There was something mm-hmm. about that visually that really struck me. And um, I think particularly in the way that they handled the wall art, where it was the animated flat uh, storytelling. When I was watching it, I felt kind of like, okay, this is a little bit too much violating the rule, like show, don't tell. I felt, I felt like it was mm. it, the introduction, the, the context of adding that in felt a little bit forced, but I'm so glad they added it in because it was gorgeous. So that's, I guess that's um, my, main, my main feelings on that. I love, that's, that's cool. That's super cool. I, I really like the multiple times that we see this um, stone like you know you the there's the water's so rare like it's it's the, the water you know washes away uh starts us anew and that's really lacking not only do we need to quench our thirst but we need to, it's really hard to quench our our souls because there's just not enough clean water for us and the empire is ruined it. the empire the great parasite speaking of rebels they tried to suck lethal dry the only plan the empire didn't conquer as far as we know and it's because of the hope that is in within that familial cast. And we see the familial bond there too. You know, the, the little girl, her name is, um, is, uh, Tachina, right? Yeah. Yeah, Tachina. Uh, she is, um, gets herself in a lot of trouble, uh, and almost gets herself and her sister killed. Uh, uh, Coden, of course, it's sort of funny. Like, I think when we're younger, we're Tachina, and we think that the Cotons of the world, like our parents, our mentors, our older brothers and sisters, they're so lame and they hold us back. And but I'll never be like that. But we all end up being like that because maturity kicks in. And it's great to see this because does she she obviously has force abilities. Instead of a lightsaber, she's got like a bow staff, a little bit of Donatello action going on there. And it I don't, does it light up or is it just the way she moves it around? Is like you know what I mean? It, it didn't wasn't like. You know, I mean, it lit up infused. gold, which reminds me of the yeah. rest of the planet, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. So it's like it's when she's connected. You know, the great thing about the force is it's an energy field created by all living things and it's all connected, right? So when she's in touch with herself, that that's why I said organic. Um, it's the same colors that we see with the force. And when you see that story of how the Empire takes over in the, the, the ATST, the Scout Walker showing up and all that animation was was really, really stunning. The fight sequence in the end and, and the action stuff, which is sort of classic Star Wars, uh, like ep- circa episode two kind of stuff. But it really, really worked um, at the end when they both are using the force together. I'm still not convinced that Tachina has any force ability, but I think it's her belief <laughs> in it. Uh, and I think that builds up her sister because they're united together. And maybe she does have some latent force abilities, but I don't I don't I didn't get that. I just got the sense of. She was sort of she was almost became like a kyber crystal for her older sister because a kyber crystal at its core, the reason it's so effective for a Jedi is it helps you get in tune with the force and center yourself. It's it's a very Zen thing. So a kyber crystal not only powers the the lightsaber, but also helps the Jedi Knight 
wielding it to focus. Hmm. And I feel like she kind of takes on that role for hmm. that. And I like the refreshing aspects over and over again of, you know, you've got to get the clean water. You've, you've got to start new, you know, and they sort of re re I keep making everything Christian about this, but I feel like there's a lot of it there. Uh, sort of rebaptizing, reframing the context of how you see the world. And they do it so well that the empire is gone. And I, and this, this Imperial, uh, I'm not sure I'm looking, I don't, I don't know what the name of this Imperial is, but he's just like, uh, just a bozo, like a, a pencil pushing Imperial bozo. And it was good to see his come up as, but it was fun. I, I, th- I think we're probably ready to move on, but uh, Alex, mm-hmm. we'll start with you just for this, just to spice it up a little bit. What's your letter grade for this one? For this one, I think, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to be that teacher giving out A's across the board, so I'm going to have to give a B somewhere, but I guess I'll, I'll give this another A minus. I mean, I, I would have given it a B plus only because it felt less exciting than other episodes, but I think there was depth here. And I, I think there was, there was more to talk about than I expected there to be. So mm-hmm. I'll land on an A minus again. Okay. Uh, David. Well, this is the one that for me is right there with Sith. So I had this in my mind as an A+, plus, but in my head, I'm, I can hear Mason right now when he does the, you know, out of five stars, you know, uh, 4.9, whatever. He's, always doing, yeah. he's doing that to you, Dan. Yeah. You know, he's just <laughs> tormenting your soul. And you're like, wait, how does that work? And it's, oh, Dad, it's 4.978, mm. whatever. I, I have this one just slightly above Sith. I think because of how emotional it is from start to finish, mom becoming a star, all of the people they talk, this is genocide. When all of the family, they're all up there, they're all stars. And I love the the, the clouds clearing and them feeling as two daughters reattached to their mother. And um, so, uh, and I think the other thing too is that little twist, Dan, Dan, you mentioned. I thought the girls were doing it. I love, I didn't even think about what you said that, that Tachina might not have any at all, but together she's like a Kyber crystal. I really like that. That makes me like this episode even more when you said that. And, and I thought, wait, they're going to crush the ATST's head like the Ewoks did in, you know, return of the Jedi. But no, the twist is they're pulling the water down Mm -hmm. and there's the, that's the key. And that takes out the ATST takes out that Imperial officer Snow troopers, not quite sure why there's snow troopers when there's no snow. Just side yeah. note, sorry. Um, well, but, the snow is it, frozen water, right? And they're stilted in their growth. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, wow. Boom. Take that. Boom. All right. I love it. That's canon. And so we'll go with that. And But I, I just, I really enjoyed this one um, for all those reasons and the things you guys said. It's really made it my, my favorite so far. Oh, you know, one glad. one last question before we move on. Have either like is this the first time we've seen lightsiders with masks? Have we seen that before? I mean, I don't know if they count as lightsiders. They don't identify as Jedi or using the Force, but I don't know if we've seen that elsewhere. Uh, Zori Bliss uh, in the Rise of Skywalker. Oh, uh, yep. Um, uh, well, I just got. I know that thing is saying time remaining, but just ignore that. Um, uh, I think I'm about to get counterexampled, so maybe not. No, I, I that's the only one I can think of. Oh, Boosh, uh, Leia's disguise, although she's supposed to be evil, even though she's oh, yeah. obviously not evil. Uh, God, oh, you know, Leia when she was training, and was it in, yeah. um, Last Jedi and that CGI Rise flashback of, scene? Rise of Skywalker, that was Rise of Skywalker, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, that was just but, my last note, but those are, I mean, all of if all of our examples are from uh, episode nine, I don't know if that's a good sample size. <laughs> Um, it, God bless episode. I need to watch it again. Uh, in fact, Mason and I were talking about that. My my grade for this episode is a B, and uh, oh. with it. it's a B. You know, it's it's good. It, a B is very good. Um, but if Sith is my A plus, I mean this, um, animation wise, this is an A plus. I think it's it's one of my favorite ones to look at. It's it's gorgeous. I like the ideas. Um, I think it's 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 really nice it's really nicely done uh but it doesn't hit me as hard as the others but that being said as as we've all mentioned it's got some really nice big ideas that um are definitely worth another look all right let's look 
at episode four. We've got two left. I know we're going a little bit long, so we appreciate you sticking with us. This is the animation studio is is Ardman. Uh Magdalena Osinska is the story. Uh, this is called I Am Your Mother. Uh, it's got Wedge Antilles as sort of a game show host, kind of. Uh, and it's another unique planet. Now, this does seem to be clay, right? Is this clay mission? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It looks like it. Um, and there's a new flight academy. And one of the tweet likes her name is Annie. Hello. Did you like that parallel? Um, uh, and her mother uh, is Kalina. And there's a lot of hijinks that happen um david what's your one word for this uh, and overall thoughts on it oh yeah for me the, the first word immediately is fun this is fun you know and um you know i i like you said dan this is absolutely clay this is the the wallace and gromit right i think Ardman's the creator of 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 that type that's of right style, mm-hmm. right and so um i enjoyed it it was fun um of course i love hearing um dennis lawson i think they obviously worked on his voice in the uh, in the recording studio to make him sound younger and upbeat. And I thought that was really cool. Um, I did need to look up Hannah city. It is the capital of Chandrilla. Um, <clears throat> I knew I recognized that Hannah city flight Academy's annual race day had to write it down, but um, it was cute. I liked Z one Z one, right. As uh, basically an R two D two as a dog. That was yeah. cute. And uh, or a slinky, a slinky <laughs> yeah, dog. I thought a slink, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> slink dog. Actually, yes, at Toy Story, we got to change slinky dog over to over to this. Um, I liked, um, um, I liked the Ryloth roll, and uh, also that Dorota and Julian Van Riepel, they were good little baddies to uh cheer against and to watch them lose. So, very lighthearted, very fun. They reminded me of that uh, Hanna Barbera cartoon, The Lap Olympics, where like there'd be all these different versions of uh, Hanna Barbera characters racing against each other, and they yeah. kind of seem like they'd be up there with Snidely Whiplash or somebody like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Alex, uh, what do you think of this one? Oh, so my my word was gonna be fun, but I think I'll change that to funny because that's also true. I thought this was a really like fun, amusing, funny episode. I, I found myself laughing a lot. I mean, there was a scene where. The Wookiee, which I don't remember his name, but he was my favorite depiction of any Wookiee. Just seeing a claymation <laughs> Wookiee was awesome. That's cool. And I yeah. saw him and I was like, oh my God, that's freaking cool. So uh, <laughs> there was one scene where I think he took a doll and ripped his arms off. And I was like, oh my God, okay, that's that's comedic gold. That's brilliant. Um, I liked seeing Jawas that weren't on Tatooine. I know we've seen that elsewhere. I don't remember where. And Mando. Uh, in Mando, yeah. Um so I thought that was fun. I love that Wedge has merch now. I just thought that was hilarious. Like <laughs> yes. we've never seen Luke with Luke merch, and I feel I don't know, but but Wedge is famous in the galaxy, so that's cool. Um, uh, I mean, I've got some other thoughts too. One is that it felt like the cityscape was very reminiscent of old Ralph McQuarrie art. Like it, it <laughs> felt like it was straight out of the sketches. It was just like the way the, the way the architecture was rounded and elongated in certain ways. It felt it felt very cool. Um, and then my my proudest moment as a viewer of this episode was when uh, I think when oh I don't remember her name what is Annie's mom's name uh, I just had it Kalina. Uh, Kalina Kalina yeah so when Kalina is landing with her uh, her 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 tugboat ship in front of the race you see some clothes falling out of it the first thing you see is a bra. And I was watching it with some friends and I said, oh my God, there are no bras in space. And that was, I think, a famous George Lucas thing, right? That's that right, was, for Leia. For yeah, and picture. so I was proud of this only because I was the only one in the room to have noticed that. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm now the nerdiest one in this room. Um, so I really, that that episode enjoyed me or uh, stuck, with, stuck with me mainly, uh, I think mainly because of that moment. But I thought it, I thought it was nice. It was about like a, a better relationship with your parents and that's great. Yes, uh, you should wear that like a badge if you're the nurse. That's good. Um, I uh, I would call this one more of this. I would call it charming. I I I thought it was. Um, I like the twist on the father motif because we don't have enough examples. First of all, we don't have hardly any examples of healthy father son relationships besides um, Mando and Grogu and Kanan and Ezra to a degree as well. I think, although they're more like brothers. I think I would argue, but. Uh, this one I found, I thought it, I also almost called it awkward, but I was afraid that would come across as negative because I feel like the main character in this episode, 
uh, Annie, I was so mortified for her when that bra came floating down and with it, like the animation it, and it almost looked like it had texture. I was like, I was like, Oh gosh, I was almost uncomfortable. And I thought if I feel this way, and he's got to be devastated. It's no wonder she doesn't want to bring her mother or tell her about this race. And I almost thought, gosh, do I, I don't know if I need this in star Wars, but it's not about that. It's about trying to convey an emotion and, and to show us, how Annie would feel. And I'm not a teenage girl, uh, but I would imagine that would be like the most traumatic thing you could possibly imagine or, well, I'm being a little hyperbolic, but you get the idea. And so that was very effective and it was fun. The Wookiee stuff was great. Ripping off that, that, um, that plushes arms. I thought, Oh boy, that's a little on the nose, but it was also really clever and creative. And the Wookiee, the clay, the animated Wookiee did look awesome. It almost looked like when you make those Play-Doh spaghetti noodles, yeah. that it was all the the brown fur uh, and yes, exactly. Shri Wook. It was super cool, uh, David. What, do you, what? Anything you want to bring up about "I Am Your Mother"? Well, I, you know, I, I thought about Zed One, um, this R two D two Slinky Dog showing a hologram of young Annie flying with her mother back in the day. I love that. And, and I, love I that. just the homage again is. R2 showing Luke the hologram, the classic hologram of Leia. And I can see, you know, Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker saying, I don't, what, what does he say? That that's, 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 that's really low or something. You know, that's he, R2 shows him that to, to get him back into, into the, the fight. And I, I, I know it didn't have the same effect here, but I think it's that point of kind of showing Annie, Hey, do you remember that? And just like, R2 showing Luke, hey, do you remember this? And so I thought that was really neat. I love that little hologram action. Um, I also liked, again, like I said, the, the Ryloth role, and I love how um, uh, Kalina, the mom, uh, doesn't want to lose to the posh pants. I thought that was pretty funny. Posh pants. <laughs> but, but you can't lose to people who have posh pants. I guess, so. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that was cute. That was fun. That's great. What do you think? Well, you know, I mean, when I was uh, like talking more about the uh, the posh pants thing, I mean, when I was watching the behind the scenes uh, thing with, uh, with the studio that made this, um, they pointed out that, uh, oh God, I'm blanking on their names, Annie and Kalina, um, okay. they're the only Twi'leks and they're racing against humans. Uh, they're, and so th- that was like an, another point of them being set aside from, I think the rest of the community, they've named that specific move, the Ryloth role. They're not on Ryloth. They must know where they're from. Um, and they, so they must know that they're, they're different. Um, and so I could see that contributing to some of, uh, I don't know, Annie's discomfort or like self-awareness of not fitting in the way everyone else does. So I thought that, uh, that stuck with me. And then, um, just a couple other little Easter eggs I loved. One was the little Death Star gun that popped up on uh, on Fancy Pants' ship. Yeah. Uh, the other is the line, um, what was it? Second place is last place. Have you guys yes. seen Talladega Nights? Uh-huh. Yeah, so immediately I heard Ricky Bobby saying, if you ain't first, you're last. <laughs> and I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I guess, so I'm, I'm also... Uh, and then I'm, I'm sure we all noticed the, the Mando mask for, yes. uh, for, for welding, but that was uh, cool. something that really, that really, I'm, I'm a big Harry Potter fan outside of star Wars. I Same. have room for lots of fandom. Uh, but I was reminded kind of of the Weasleys. Uh, I mean, Ron's always hmm. been embarrassed of his mother and of his family's, uh, I, I think frugality, but like they're being different than everyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, I very much got the sense that uh, Annie's family is not as rich as fancy pants family. And so some of this, I mean, like I've been a Harry Potter fan for as long as I've been able to read. So that's like my first fandom. And so I was really strongly reminded of that dynamic. And so that, I think those are most of my thoughts on this episode. That's a fun compared. It wouldn't have been great if when Kalina lands and you see like a big sweater with a giant oh. A on it floating down. Speaking of the Weasleys, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I liked that this was lighthearted and I liked uh, the flashback that you mentioned, David, with, the memory of her with her daughter. It made me instantly think of, of my boys when they were little, uh, especially Macy because he's the youngest and it just, Oh gosh, I thought they're, they're 
if you're a parent, you know what that is. And it's, it's un, it's indescribable because you, you're so proud of who the, your kids are as they're, as they're older, but there's always at that moment, gosh, if I could just have one hour when they were little again. And it's, it, it's, it's such a cool thing. I feel like this was a really accurate portrayal of a mother daughter relationship of a parent and a child. Hmm. I really liked that a lot. I like the twistiness. Um, I, I found this one to be a little more like um, a playful Pixar uh, mm-hmm. clip before the actual thing, like a little animated short. You know what I mean? Uh, so I liked it. This sort of hit me the way the uh, the one in season one did. It was sort of like a, a homage to Pinocchio. Mm-hmm. So it definitely was not as high on my list. I like when I see visions, I want the mythical stuff, but there is a place for this too. And, and uh, I'll just start with my letter grade. We kind of go in reverse order. I really want to give it a, a C because it's just, it's fine. But again, Sith is my thing. But I will give it a very, very generous B minus because I really like the 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 parent uh, child stuff. I Again, nothing I would, wrong with it. It's just that my recipe is just different. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think I would give it a B. Um, I mean, I get I guess like my mark for whether something is B worthy is like this is not the best thing I've seen. It's not awful. I had a good time watching it. But if I could pick having more of this kind of story or more of any of the other stories. I think I'd pick the other ones. So that really tells me this is not a work. I, I feel bad giving it a C. That's not going to go good on their transcript, but I'll give them a B. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's my grading on this. That's great. Uh, David. Yeah. B minus for me. Uh, this is the lowest one out of all five of these for me. Um, I, I like what both of you said. Enjoyable, fun. Um, I don't want to make the transcript look bad. So we'll go with a B yeah. minus. I th- they'll be able to handle it. I think. Yeah. Uh, their letter recommendation will set them over the top. That'll set them apart. <laughs> All right, let's let's look at uh, the fifth episode, and as we wrap up, uh, journey to the dark head. This is uh, about an adolescent monk named Ara, who believes that the status of her home planet is going to be able to be dictated by destroying this statue, uh, and she uh, is has to go to the Jedi for help. And she gets a Padawan named Tol, T-O-U-L, to the task. Um, and mm. they're on the run from a Sith Lord named Bishan, B-I-C-H-A-N. And I don't know that name for some reason sounds very familiar to me. I can't quite place it. Uh, but uh, this one is also the longest of the, the five that we've talked about. Uh, David, uh, one word and overall reactions to this one. Yeah, uh, this very easy for me to come up with the word here, challenging extremely challenging the from the very beginning um the young girl ara is challenging the interpreter right that's i think in the credits they call this guy um all the way through tool a uh, tool tool and ara challenging each other bishan challenging uh tool really wanting to bring him in leaving him alive to ultimately try to bring him back as a as a as an apprentice um and then even at the very end, the conversation between uh, Toll and Era about war. And I keep in my head as I'm watching this episode, I watched it again tonight. Um, what always came to mind is the saying, if there's anything that humans have learned from history, it's that humans have learned nothing from history, right? We're, it's really hard for us to, to really get past this stuff. Um, you know, going back to, uh, uh, a man's search for meaning, you know, and uh, Victor Frankel was Jewish. Uh, I had a number of Jewish clients in my office today. I have a, quite a few of them. And um, uh, we were talking about how my son went to Auschwitz last year um, oh. on a school trip, went to Auschwitz. And um, I wanted to go. I wasn't able to. My, my friend went with his son and my son. And so I felt good about him being there. But he sent me three pictures from Auschwitz. That's it. Because, again, they don't want you... They want you very somber, very respectful before you go in and as you're in. But my friend took a picture of a plaque outside of Auschwitz about don't ever forget this. And something that I hear my Jewish clients talking about now is the feeling like it feels like people are forgetting some of these atrocities that have occurred. And when I hear Toll and Era speaking to each other, they're wanting to change the tide of the war 
but they kind of feel like, you know, uh, I think like the interpreter at the beginning, it's always going to be with us. You don't want that to be the case, but that's challenging to hear. So all of it really ties in nicely for me. And uh, again, challenging to me and challenging for these characters. Mm. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. That's, that's a uh, very well said Alex, uh, one word and overall thoughts to this one. Yeah. My, uh, I was really excited about this episode. This was tied for my favorite, I think, with Sith. Um, my the word that comes to mind is Sisyphean, and that's oh, because really? uh, yeah. So, um, huh. uh, so you know, actually, for anyone listening who doesn't know what Sisyphean means, Sisyphean is a, a description of something that is evocative of the myth of Sisyphus, and the myth of Sisyphus is the story of basically a a man destined to roll a boulder up a hill every day only for it to roll back to the bottom at the end of the day. And the trick for, uh, for Sisyphus, I think this comes from Camus. Um, the trick for Sisyphus to find meaning in life is to find meaning in the toil of pushing the boulder, uh, the boulder to the top of the hill and having it roll back down again, only to know you're going to do that again in the future. Um, it's to lean into that is to say yes to this, this existence. Um, the reason Sisyphean came to mind as the word is so the the last bit of dialogue. Um, I'm really bad with character names, but between the the pilot and the Jedi, um, pilot is Ara and the Jedi is Toll. Between Ara and Toll, uh, that last piece of dialogue was the most exciting part to me, and the reason was that it felt like they were kind of describing a a dissonance I've felt for a long time with Star Wars, which is like God. It seems like there, there keeps being an evil presence. We keep overthrowing it and then it just keeps coming back. And like, what are these writers thinking? And, and this kind of, I, I don't know, give me a different perspective where at, now I'm kind of thinking, Oh, like, well, that, that's kind of realistic. I mean, we, we might overthrow some kind of evil in the world only for a new one to come up. And then like, we, we find hope we, we uh, push forward. We do our best in the face of that. Um, and, and so I think that, uh, that really struck me as something that kind of shifted my perspective on the entire way that Star Wars works, which I, I thought really, really stuck with me. Wow. Well, I'm so glad that you used that word. No one's used that word yet. That's great. My word is masterful. Mm. I thought this was this. I mean, this also I'm tempted to say it's tied with Sith, but I might put it a little bit above for a lot of reasons. Um, I thought it was uh, it was. It was beautifully animated. It's 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 the most anime of all of them that we've talked about so far on this episode of Coffee with Kenobi. And if all anime was like this, I'd be a big anime fan or anime, if if you prefer. the 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 ideas here, I like that you talk about the the Sisyphus here because at the end, I thought, well, gosh, they're basically saying, well, heck. What's the point? This is going to happen again. But they're not discouraged by it. They they almost become sort of playful about it. Now you know that that is not fully actual. Like psychologically speaking, they are very aware that you could easily give up or be frustrated if you have to do the same stuff over and over again. But I don't think that's true. I think they found something within themselves. I think they found a new bond. And of anything in visions I've ever seen, and there's some in season one I might make a case for as well, but this is the one story I would really like to see continued because I want to spend more time with Toll. And I am I am the least interested in shipping of anybody on the planet. I could not care less about people coupling up that are fictional. I just don't care about it. Um, that's great if you do. But these two... I want them to get married and have lots of Jedi babies. They were <laughs> awesome. And for me to say that, that's a big deal because that, that's really not my thing. It's not my cup of coffee, so to speak. Um, the, uh, the, the metaphor of the cutting off the head uh, was cool. Uh, I, I wasn't quite sure if that particular aspect of it worked for me, but we can talk about that later. Uh, so anyway, I've opened up a lot of things here, but uh, Alex, we'll start with you on this. What are some key things you'd like to bring up for the episode? I mean, I, I loved the way that the two giant statues looked. They reminded me of the two ancient kings of Gondor on the River Anduin in Lord of the Rings. Uh, and I, I just saw that and I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. Um, other things I was thinking is like very on early on, we saw, I don't remember what they were called, prophecy stones. Mm -hmm. um, that got me thinking two things. One that reminds me of a Palantir, 
again from Lord of the Rings. Um, the second is that it got me thinking like, wait, the Jedi always caution against prophecy. The future is always in flux. It's in motion. It's in I motion. can't believe there's an entire group of people dedicated to force prophecy when from everything we've been told. I mean, I know this is not canon, or at least I, I think this is not canon. No, it's not. Um, but yet they don't want to talk to the Jedi, but they're, I was so intrigued yeah. by that dichotomy there. Yeah, and so, I mean, I, I maybe related, I, I got thinking, like, at the very beginning, I kept speculating, like, okay, this is clearly a really cool place. What is this? Is this Mortis? Like, are we looking uh, at, like, at the father figure saying our role is not to intervene, our role is to observe and record? Um, we have we don't know a lot about the father from, from that arc. I don't think it was ever revisited except in, like, wall and art. Rebels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think my, my hopes were dashed there. I don't think that's the father, <laughs> but I got very excited. He, I mean, he looked like the Gandalf Dumbledore figure Agreed. um, with the, this focus on, on, on balance. And I heard the, 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 the girls, uh, it was Ara, Ara, Ara's Ara. Mm-hmm. Uh, prophecy about the, uh, the two figures and the third. And I was like, Oh my God, it's the sister. It's the brother. It's the father. He's the third. And then I was totally wrong, but. But it was a really exciting couple of minutes as I let myself believe we were getting some backstory. I like that a lot. It, that, I kind of was thinking that too, but I didn't let myself go there because I knew it wasn't in the same uh, canon timeline. That was a but, good call. I got too disappointed. But no, I I, I like that a lot. I, kind of the idea of like the father being a teacher, but interesting. So interesting. You would like the idea of the father being a teacher. Yes. Of course. <laughs> it kind of clicks the boxes for me. Uh, go ahead, dude. Well, I thought it was really interesting to see a Jedi Council or a mini Jedi Council. Yeah. At a base station, right? With the stars outside. And mm-hmm. and then I was like, whoa. And I, you know, and I, I wrote the names down. Master. A cup, a ship. You were expecting them to do yeah, that. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, uh, Master Duta, Master. Lisigam and Master Moru, and um, just really cool stuff. I thought that was really neat. That that the one I believe, if I get it correct, Master Duto was the one saying send Toll on this. Master Legisum is the guy who says, "Are you really seriously considering this?" And then Master Moru is the one who came and said, "Toll, you know, he was meditating with the tra- uh, trainee." Um, says, hey, you're, you know, the Jedi Council wants you to go. And so I'm like, is this the, is that just a small gathering? Like you'd see maybe Obi-Wan and Anakin gather on a ship or something, or is that the council, um, not on Coruscant, whatever. Very cool to see that. But I do think, um, going back to what we saw even in Sith, um, the, the balance I was mentioning to you in, in the stars between Tachina and Koten, here at the end you see Toll, he defeats Bishan when he has the insight, right? He learns why the council sent him. And it's, again, it's that balance of light and dark. You see his eyes red or orange, then you see it blue. And also, it's not just there that you see him learning, but then in what both of you said in that conversation at the end, where he talks about hope and despair and that balance there. Um, but let's give it a shot. Let's try it. And um, I thought that was neat. The other thing I was going to mention you know, the more that's revealed, not only that you couldn't see the heads initially up in the clouds, but then when you get up there, this ring connecting the heads, the set, I didn't really, I was taking it all in. It was so like unbelievably cool. And then the second time watching, I'm looking, I'm like, oh my gosh, Dan, you said all of the blue and red kyber crystal inside. Cause when they broke through the top, I'm like, wait, what? Tons of kyber crystal. And it's almost like, right, the rain is filtering through that down into this temple. So, again, it just my mind is whirling. I can't even get my head around all of that, of what we saw. So, um, yeah, just seeing the vast amounts of Kyber, not on what, Ilum, right, where Yoda takes the young right. and stuff. So, very cool. Um, those are just some of the things that really stood out to me. Uh, the, we haven't really talked much about the Padawan in this. Again, his name is, is Toll, T-O-U-L. And uh, he um, he gives an anger. Uh, you can see it in his eyes. His eyes tell a lot. And uh, this Sith Lord named Bishan, who when his mask comes off, he's like this um, 
this like he makes Adam Driver look pedestrian. Like he's got this long flowing hair, he's this handsome guy. Um, yeah, exactly. And he's so compelling in his own way. He's very charismatic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't really see a lot of stuff like that. I mean, Duca was charismatic, but he was presented as an older, a regal gentleman. I was thinking Duku. I mean, he's he's yeah. composed. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. And this he has a sort of a manner of speaking. You know, uses his his words along with his um, the way he manipulates. But he's chasing after Tal, and they they have a great fight sequence. I, I will say that in all of these episodes, I do think it's interesting, and this is and it made me kind of think about Star Wars in general, even with Ahsoka. Like who I think is sort of the the ultimate, to me, the ultimate embodiment of what it means to be a, a, a perfect Jedi. And Ahsoka would never say that, which is why she's the perfect Jedi. But this continues to perpetuate this notion, and I'm not judging, I'm just noticing it. This myth of redemptive violence, that in order for us to accomplish our goals, we must kill the villain. We must kill the enemy. Hmm. Now, can this guy be redeemed? Doesn't it seem that way? Uh, that's why Luke is so his- incredible in, in Return of the Jedi, because he doesn't want to kill Vader. He, in fact, he throws his weapon away. Luke mm-hmm. is another poster child for what it means to be a Jedi, but he loses his way, which makes him human and very relatable and, and fascinating. But I just wanted to point that out. Uh, that all being said, I, I love the ending sequence and the idea that, you know, dark and light have to coexist for a long time. And I actually wrote about this in the Star Wars book. You know, what does balance in the force mean? Well, it could mean you eradicate evil and they're just good because evil is so powerful. It's overcoming the balance. Well, they both have to exist, but a little less dark is so much has so much more weight to it than a whole lot of light. And if you don't think and if you think I'm exaggerating, then then open up Twitter or pick up a newspaper. What's Mm. on the front page? What's trending? Usually it's the bad stuff, right? A little bit of dark has a lot of weight to it. Mm-hmm. So it, that's an interesting idea. And ultimately they don't really destroy these statues because they've got to coexist. And of course, in tall and metaphorically, he manages to balance out and fight the darkness within him. And he, he did, has, off, did cut off the head yeah. right, of the Sith Lord. So they, they managed to take off the head of the dark side. And <laughs> that's true. That's in a true. Roundabout way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's very interesting. And I, and I like that you could almost argue that, you know, again, is is killing this thing? Is that does that mean that you've conquered evil, or that or that are you part of the problem? And I, I think I'm just sort of adding an extra philosophical strands that may not necessarily work here. But I I think as a story, it's important to talk about, it. and it also leaves a few more questions and answers because the resolution doesn't quite feel resolved because of the way they comment on it. But that to me makes it a lot richer because there's more to tell, and it's also not. Uh, under this illusion that you know you can defeat evil and that's it because you can't but you can learn to cope with it you can learn to cope with it and to fight it and the best way to do that and what i would tell my students and my own kids is you fight the inner demons you be your best you and then come what may you can't control that but you can certainly control how you look at it was that uh, psychologist enough for you david how'd i do oh my gosh <laughs> you're you're laying it down man <laughs> you've got your honor i told you before man you got your honorary doctorate i'll t- i'll put it right back here put it up yeah, and and it's it's perfectly poetic i mean i know we have a uh we, we have a an artificially packaged set of five episodes that we're looking at right now but we're we're ending with a- acceptance of like the the necessity of dark and we begin with that too in the sith episode where the the task of Lola is to it's to accept the dark on the inside, and you also see like her. I mean, you mentioned redemption. I, this was something on my mind too with Sith episode, but you you see her on the path of redemption. Now, that's something I think we've seen here for the first time for a a dark sider. Yeah, I mean, we we know that like that Ventress left the Sith. We didn't see her really get redeemed. She just wasn't a Sith anymore. We, we know that Anakin was redeemed, but that was really fast and he died immediately. Mm-hmm. And we saw a little bit of Ben Solo on the on the path of redemption. But again, he was he was kind of killed kind of quickly. So and he didn't first say time. anything. Right. Yeah. And so so this is the first time we've seen it like the lived experience of, of trying to, uh, to to live out the path of redemption by, um, I think, like Ahsoka, not not flipping to the other side. 
but accepting that both of these things have to coexist. And right. I just thought that was really, really neat and, and, and rhymes nicely as everything Star Wars should. Beautifully said, Alex. I love that. You are you are absolutely slaying the uh, coffee with Kenobi audition, dude. You are doing <laughs> so amazing. So well, my coffee is helping. <laughs> oh, hey, whatever. Keep it up, man. The two of you are just so perfect for this. Uh, let, let's give our letter grades uh, for this one, um, David. Yeah, this is where again I, I will channel channel my inner uh, Tom Gross. I went from this being an A plus along with Sith and in the stars within the stars slightly above this one, because of what both of you said, as I started thinking about this more, this may, be, this is more star Wars than in the stars for me, especially with the Kyber crystal the lightsaber battle, Sith, all that, this puts it just above. So this is an A plus for me and just slightly above the other ones. So my favorite out of these five. Oh, good. Yeah. I, I just want to say real quickly, uh, the little thorn uh, tentacle Dr. Octopus thing that, that, that Bishan has. That was pretty cool. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that was cool. I, I kept thinking of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, and I'm like, gosh, is this like a – is this a bonus action? I don't know. I was thinking that. Okay, Alex. <laughs> you know, no, on, on the topic of that weird tentacle thing, did that come out of his lightsaber hilt, or was that mm-hmm. a separate weapon? It did. I had to look again. That's the second viewing because I couldn't figure it out. He has it out, and he's holding toll, toll – and then he does turn it on and brings the saber over underneath his. Uh, oh yeah. Chin. Yep. Okay. That's yep. neat. It's kind of unusual for a Sith too. I mean, we saw Ezra with the the blaster. I think we saw a similar thing with uh, Cal Kestis in uh, Fallen Order. I don't quite remember, but that's neat. I think that's one of the first times we've seen something like that. That's cool. Um, this episode gets an A plus for me. I mean, I, yeah. I led with that attitude. It's it's tied for me with Sith. I thought it was just great. Mm-hmm. The the mythos is interesting. Uh, but but really, just the personal, like, it really did help me take kind of a different stance toward the the narrative trajectory of Star Wars, just helping helping me, I think, better accept that, like, uh, it's not the case that after after Vader was re- redeemed and Luke killed the Emperor, that all was well forever. Uh, and this, I, I think it it uh, it helps. I don't know. It, it it gives me a different appreciative attitude toward toward Star Wars. Um, so A plus. That makes me very happy. And I think that's what a good story does, right? It, it, it takes familiar turf and opens up new pathways, new ideas. Just when you think you've seen it all, you see something like this. This is a, a, like you, Alex. Like I I pretty much put all my cards on the table. This is an A+. This is an, a Stone Cold Lock A+. I, it's my favorite episodes of Visions that I've ever seen. Um, again, there's a few in season one that, that might uh, make a run at it, but this is great. I truly want to see what would happen uh, in the future with these characters. Um, I think the animation and the artistic style in Sith is, is better, more fresh, but this is my favorite story. And uh, now that I think about it and thinking what the two of you have said, I, I don't think it's even close. I, mm-hmm. I think I don't, it's not title. It's, it's, it's that good. It's mm-hmm. that good. You know, and I think you're right. I mean, every A plus, like if, if you get an A on a paper, you still want constructive feedback, right? So I think the constructive yes. feedback for me here is like this story, the visual style of Sith, and then just just more of it, like so much more mm-hmm. of it. I want to know what else happens in this universe. Yes, yes, uh, uh, very, very much so. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> Gentlemen, what a delight. Man, I can't wait to talk about the next four episodes. This was great, great fun. I really appreciate the both of you being here. David, of course, uh, you and Aaron do a spectacular work on Star Wars Reactions. One of the best Star Wars podcasts out there. Uh, two of the nicest, most genuine and intelligent guys. So thank you so much again for lending your time and talents. Please let everybody know where they can find you and your podcast. Yeah, you can find us um, Twitter and Facebook at SW Reactions Pod. You can find us on Instagram, Pinterest, and Tubler at SW Reactions. You can find me on uh, Twitter at David underscore Modders, M O D D E R S. And Instagram, just simply look up my name, David Modders. And Alex, uh, I hope you will join us again on Coffee with Kenobi. It was absolutely terrific. 
to chat with you about Star Wars Visions. Uh, the both of you taught me so much about this and Star Wars, which is always great. Where can people reach out to you, Alex, if they want to continue the conversation with you? Yeah, so uh, I, I think a, a couple of places. I am on Twitter, although I'm looking up my Twitter handle right now because I almost never use it. So instead of Twitter, I'd say look me up on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is at Alex Marmor. That's Alex, A-L-E-X, M as in Mary, A-R-M-O-R. You can find me there. I don't post much, though, but if, if you're interested in it, check it out. Thank you so much, Alex and David. What a great show. I'm so proud of this conversation. And as I've been saying for almost 10 years now, this show is amazing to me because of all the people I've gotten to meet and all the things I've gotten to learn from all of you. Now, I just said almost 10 years. That's actually not true. This show comes out on Thursday, May 11th. But on Friday, May 12th, it will be 10 years of Coffee with Kenobi. That's right, 10 years of doing this podcast. I did mention it on the live show this week, but I wanted to bring it up on the show proper next week. I'll try to do something a little more for the 10-year anniversary. I'm really, really proud of Coffee with Kenobi and everything that has happened because of this show. I'm so grateful to Corey Club. My co-creator, who was with me for four years before he turned over the reins to me fully, and I've been piloting the ship for a year solo, but not really solo because I've got all of you to thank. It's a great Star Wars community. I'm so happy to be a part of it, and I appreciate all of you so very much. Have a great week and weekend, everybody, and remember, this is a podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for.